One powerful finger. Okay. Good evening, and welcome to True Talks with Project Managers. This is a live talk show series that is co-sponsored by PMI Southern Maryland and PMI Washington, D.C. My name is Beth May, and I am pleased to be here to kick off tonight's show. This is the fourth of eight True Talks shows planned for 2022. Tonight's show is being recorded and will be available for replay on demand on PMI Southern Maryland's YouTube channel. You can find all the previous episodes there too. Tonight, we'll be talking about expert planning. Former US President Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. A much older quote from a different source may explain why Eisenhower felt that way about plans. A Prussian field marshal in the 1800s named Helmut, Helmuth von Moltke the Elder made an observation that has been paraphrased as, no battle plan ever survives contact with the enemy. 
The essence of both views is that plans must be reassessed and adjusted to adapt to changes in the environment. We have two special guests tonight who will share their perspectives on the value of planning and plans, Joe Lawney and Christine Wright. Before I introduce our host, I'd like to give a shout out to our producer, Dan Stay. Dan is both a project management professional and a live show production wizard. He will be monitoring the YouTube live chat for your questions and comments so that they can be addressed throughout the show. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our Two Talks host, Kendall Lott. Kendall is the CEO and president of Empowered Strategies, host of the podcast, PM Point of View, and co-founder and chairman of the board for the nonprofit Project Management for Change. He is also the president-elect for the WDC chapter. Kendall, take it away. Oh, Beth, don't run away just yet. Thanks for uh, coming back uh, and doing another guest uh, guest hosting for us. I appreciate that. That's great. Everyone should know uh, your own volunteer background is so strong. And thank you for handling the PM for Change world. And of course, the Project Management Day of Service, which I'm hoping we'll get a chance to advertise a little bit more as we come around to the next ninth annual, I think it will be. Uh, it's extraordinary. And uh, we miss, of course, Harry, who works in the uh, continuous val uh, value space for that, as we have project managers who continue to support project management in our community. So we're glad to be out here spilling across the airwaves. Uh, but thanks again for coming. And I was wondering how you got roped into it again. <laughs> it wasn't really a rope. Uh after I did it the first time, I had so much fun, and Harry thought that I did such a good job. He said, could you be interested in doing this on a more permanent basis? And I said, absolutely, because it's fun for me. So I enjoy it. I enjoy attending the shows. I, I t always take notes. I always learn something every episode. And to have the opportunity to introduce the topic and be involved behind the scenes is just icing on the cake. Well, I like your introduction to the topic. Um, mine's a little bit more um, less highfalutin than, you know, famous Prussian generals. I was just reminded that Mike Tyson once said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So uh, there you go. We have planning here tonight. So that's the topic of our thing. So, hey, YouTuberati out there, your input matters. Uh, if we get a chance, I think Beth, are you and Dan going to monitor our chat? If you come up with a question, shoot us a question, leave some comments. Remember, it is recorded. So whatever you say, somebody will see when they watch the recording again later. Um, so you do get to uh, put in your comments and let us know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. If we get a chance to answer a question or to bring the question forward, we will. Somebody will whisper sweet nothings in my ear about the questions and we'll bring that forward. So feel free to do that here tonight. We do have two guests, as Beth said. So I think we're going to take a turn to the practical uh, as we uh, look to, uh, I'm going to grab my notes here, as uh, we look to another, a, a number of things that we've done. We've, uh, we've gone from some very high management theory now and down to the basics of project management, right? Planning was, was a whole big area for us to have to tackle. So tonight with this practicality, we're going to see how it's actually done. We're moving into the woods of Pennsylvania tonight to a guild no less. You haven't heard those words in a long time, right? Since you were studying medieval history or something, right? So we're far away from the federal beltway and software development. So the first of our guests tonight is Christine Wright. Christine, are you out there somewhere? I think you're out there somewhere. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello. <clears throat> hey there. So professionally, a graphic designer, tell me when I go wrong here. Professionally, a graphic designer who runs Wright Brain Design. Fun fact, that's not Right brain, that's actually W R I G H T yeah. brain, right? Okay. Yeah. Wouldn't there be a pun in there somewhere? So you're a consultant in that environment, right? Oh, well, there's absolutely a pun in there. <laughs> Her side hustle has been as an artisan jewelry maker. So she knows the thing about getting things done on time and getting a product out the door. Maybe we should have you for product management here. Um, and the <laughs> name of that is Tricky Shiny Beads. Did they Close. get that right? Pretty, pretty shiny beads. Pretty shiny beads. I don't know where I got tricky. Pretty shiny beads. Okay, pretty shiny beads. But here, tonight we have her as the president of the Haverford Guild of Craftsmen, chapter of the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen. It's an actual guild. And yes. so there you have it. Out of King of Prussia, near Valley Forge, guild, colonial geography, makes me think about project management origins. We're going back to the Middle Ages here. Christine, how you doing? 
thinking about projects and planning? I'm good. I'm always planning. It's, there's nothing I can do to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, so, along, so along that line, let's grab some context. This guild is an unpaid volunteer position, right? It's, an, it's a volunteer organization. Right. Am, am I understanding that yeah. correctly? It looks like I'm pulling out of this, the, the frame here. Um, and uh, it sounds like something a lot of PMI chapters might be familiar with, right? Joining a chapter and, and having to, to run it and figure it out. So how long have you been running that chapter? I have been, I was, uh, co I was elected co-president in 2018, approximately three months after I joined. Um, <laughs> I, I must have something written across my forehead. I don't know. Um, and I've been running it ever since, uh, even through the, through the pandemic, which did some interesting things to our organization. Uh, so yeah, it's been since then. And um, in addition to taking on role of president, I've also taken on the role of show chairman. We put on a uh, art and fine craft show uh, about two, two times a year, most years. And um, that is a very big part of what I do. So you've taken on two different roles there. So there you were, you raised your hand to try and get something to happen and you, they made you the president. I'd been there before, I, I think right? I you showed up and they were like, you look like someone who could do this. <laughs> <laughs> so there you were, well, so there you go. So there you were having to plan. So what happened? So what is the nature of the planning that you have to do? And why is this interesting for us tonight as project managers? Well, what's what interesting is that it's essentially uh, the, the parts that I'm most going to talk about are the shows that we do, because that is a huge part of our guild. It's a big part of our mission. Um, we not only uh, we put on these shows, they're our major fundraiser. It's how we keep the lights on. Uh, however, it's also income opportunities for local artists, which is a big part of what we're trying to do for the arts in our communities is support supporting these small businesses. And for a lot of artists, um, art and fine craft shows are the best ways that they can generate an income. Um, and it's also a lot of what the Pennsylvania Guild does as well. So when I when I joined, they I was at a board meeting and they said, well, we should really start thinking about the next show. And I was like, okay, great. So what's the plan? And they all looked at me and they said, well, we just start. And I'm like, that's not a plan. <laughs> so I, you know, I did not, I came into an organization that had been around for a while. They've done lots of these shows. I'm certainly not the first one to ever put one on. Um, but I think I am the first person who really put together a formal plan that can easily be repeated and passed down as a legacy. And so I, I picked everyone's brains. I was like, okay, tell me what needs to happen in order for this show to go on successfully. And then I had to say, well, when does that need to happen by? And I went around to as many people as I could, people who had organized past shows, people who uh, organized, um, who are involved in organizing the next show, you know, and I, I basically tried to get as much experience as possible, you know, input from as much as experienced people as possible, and then put it down on paper and create. And the first thing I did was create a, a, a schedule. Um, my background being in graphic design means I've also done quite a bit of publishing work. So yeah. not having any formal project man management training, I treated it like a publishing schedule where I said, okay, this has, you know, here's a firm deadline the date of the show. I can't move that. All right. So I'm going to use this as my anchor and then came up with other deadlines and figured out what that, you know, what task relied on another task to be completed for that one and mapped the whole thing out. And that was how I really kind of got the start of it. So I didn't really bring any show planning expertise. All I did was I took what was there and I organized it. You know, that's interesting. You just said about a, about a ton of things in there that's kind of straight out of, I mean, I guess all the PMs can pack it up and go home because you just reinvented the PMBOK, basically, the PM body of knowledge. Uh, here I, here's what I heard in there. You you knew it had to be repeatable uh, and yeah. uh, passed down. So it's a it's, it becomes a communication artifact, right? It becomes a thing that oh, lets other people know what to do. Um, oh, yeah. And the idea that there are some standard things that you have to do over and over again. So there's a, you know, next year it has the same things. So repeatable. Uh, I thought that was interesting. You source it from multiple stakeholders, classic, seek expert witnesses, you know, other people who know something that can tell you what, what they've experienced or done before. Um, well, I had zero experience. 
I had Yeah, none. I was going to say, you hit it with no experience. <laughs> How big is this event? This Literally, event, we... Let me begin with. Well, generally speaking, we have um, anywhere between 50 to 75 artists participating, um, which is a, a pretty decent number. And then we have mm -hmm. anywhere between um, 700 to over 1,000 guests, depending on the season and the circumstances, who come to shop with us. So it's a pretty sizable event. Um, in fact, what was funny was uh, we also, my, the first show that I planned, it was the first year we were using our current venue, and um, they were surprised. They were like, well, you got a lot of people here. <laughs> so. What kind of venue is it? Is it a campground or is it a mall, an old mall? What, what are you using as a venue? No, it's actually a community center. So in Haverford, there's the uh, Community Recreation and Environmental Center, and it's, uh, it's, we, do, we try to do indoor shows. A lot of our artists have delicate work or very, very breakable work. Uh, and the other advantage to doing an indoor show is that you are less weather dependent um, because we don't have the bandwidth to plan for rain. You know, rain dates are a lot harder to plan for. And, um, you know, it, it, it's always a gamble. These, this kind of event is a huge gamble. So it's one of those things where it's like, okay, indoor event, it's essentially in a double gym. And we take over the entire gym space for two days, which, you know, actually three days because we do one full setup day. And um, it's it's one of those things where it took a while to convince the venue that this was something worth letting us in for. Um, but it's worked out very well, and we're developing a very nice partnership with them. Well, I was struck by a couple other things you said in there too. You jumped out with schedule. That's the that's the easiest I think thing to see, but that was clear because time matters so much in the type of project you're doing here, right? And oh, yeah. uh, then you walked right through critical path there. You were like, "Well, I found out the thing that couldn't move, the first thing, and then everything had to be related to that." So that was a critical critical path development in there, uh, looking at dependencies, right? Sequences, yeah. dependencies. Yeah. Did you do it all, or did you have other people doing parts of this, either the planning or the execution? Then. I, I took control of most of the planning. I think I was the, really the only person there who had, in a professional capacity, ever had to take something complicated and make sure it got done on time, um, or at least as I was aware of. Uh, it was one of those things where the first time I showed my list of deadlines and due dates and all this other stuff, I had a couple people say to me, oh, that's too much. I can't handle all this. So what I started doing is I started breaking it down and only sharing the deadlines with the people who needed them. I kept a master so that I could keep track of everything, kind of like almost like a ringleader in a circus. Um, but I didn't want to overwhelm because, again, we're a volunteer organization. Most of the people are retired, uh, so they don't have all the energy in the world. Um, so it became a question of uh, not just, I guess, project management, but also a lot of communications management. And I took over the bulk of that. However, I have a really strong board and a really great group of volunteers where I've got one person who says, I will do the booth layout. And that's what he does. He will just, you know, I just, I hand him the names, give him all the information he needs and he does his thing and he makes sure it, his part gets done on time. And I am good with that. That is, that's my favorite kind of planning where I can say, okay, here's your piece. Here's where it needs to begin. Here's where it needs to end. And then it gets done. And I have another person who handles the social media, and she does a fabulous job of it. All I have to do is give her the dates. And she I give her the dates and all the information she needs, and she's off to the horses. I don't love I, I don't love micromanagement. I don't think it helps anyone. So wherever I can let somebody do their thing, I'm fine with that. That's that's exactly what I'm hoping to do. Because it doesn't help me and it doesn't help them for me to be like, okay. Did you wake up this morning and tie your shoes? Like nobody needs that. Yeah. Well, I'm struck also by you have a date certain. I imagine you're setting the time that you're allowed to be in the community center. So a lot of what we deal with in some other environments is needing to be highly adaptive because we're producing minimally viable products and we're trying, oh, things yeah. can shift around and we can shift. In your case, one of the interesting things that I've, that I've seen before in these, in event management, weddings, plays, performances, uh, exhibits, 
is the time does not get to move full stop. It doesn't get to move. So everything you're going to do has to be ready for that, which means the scope or the amount of things you're going to do, the number of artists have to get there, I would imagine. And then you probably have a quality issue. Like, how do you know how well and how did you plan for quality? What constitutes quality? Was that a discussion? Is that something everybody oh, just yeah. gets? Or is that something quality, you had to talk about? Quality is a huge, huge deal, um, especially with what we do, because there's a lot mm. of different craft shows out there. There's, you know, the kind of craft show that, you know, the school puts on, the elementary school puts on to raise funds, the PTA does, you know, and then there are craft shows that, you know, they're in a park and it was just a sign up thing. We put on fine art shows, basically. And so we jury every person who comes in and that is part of the planning process. So we have a date that applications close. Then we have a group of people who judge the work that they have to, you know, basically score all of the applications that are submitted. And then we let the artists know which ones are in, which ones are waitlisted, which ones are not in. Um, and that's all part of the process. And that quality is very important. The other, the other side to, to quality too, is also the quality of our marketing and advertising. We have to, we have to make sure that that's on schedule because, you know, if you don't get things word out soon enough, people aren't going to show up. So that's important. And then also when it comes to our relationship with the venue, you know, we have to make sure that we don't scratch up the floors, that we don't ding doorways, <laughs> that we don't, you know, we have to, we have to, and, and a lot of that comes down to traffic flow and figuring out ways of getting people in and out efficiently, keeping the artists happy because we make load in, load out as smooth as humanly possible. You know, one thing I always try to explain to people is that I do not judge character for a person's personality based off of load in or load out because that is the most stressful time for everybody. Everyone is, is clinically insane during that period of time. So I don't I don't sweat it too much. My goal is to keep everybody healthy, happy, alive, and not killing each other. And I count that as a win. <laughs> so does your board. We actually to that point about artists, we have a question coming in uh, on the uh, the channel here is because you've had multiple hats in different professional environments, I think you might be be able to speak to this specifically, comparatively, is how is it different having stakeholders, key players for you, that are the artists, they've got an opinion, versus when you have clients, for example, or when you're working in inside an organization, corporate stakeholders? I think the interesting thing about that is that with artists, they have the option to not come back. They're as much your client as they are your, um, I don't want to say vendor, because that's not a word we like using, but really that's what it is. It's we need the artists to put on the show and we, and, and we need good artists so that people come and shop. So they all kind of feed into each other. So in some ways we need to keep the artists happy because they are our clients. But we also rely on them as a part of the organization when they show up to the show. So, and, and this is true of every art and fine craft show that's out there, is that, you know, there's essentially a contract that you sign when you fill out an application that basically lays out the rules of the road and how things are going to work, um, what is allowed and not allowed. Uh, like, for example, um, we, we do say, you know, all work must be original. That is a very big rule. And if we, if our floor jewelry walks around and they sees like say a licensed character in someone's work, we'll tell them to pull it down because that's part of the rules. They cannot do that. You know, our, all artists have to stay for the duration of the show. They may not pack up early, full stop. Um, the only exceptions are made if, is if somebody truly gets ill. Uh, so we hold them to those standards like we would as though they were almost Please. But at the same time, we also want to make it as pleasant an experience because we know that essentially that they don't have to be there if they don't want to be. So it's kind yeah, of I, a very weird, weird line that you have to straddle. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Didn't wasn't aware. You have uh, governance by walking around. 
uh, people kind of like enforcing the standard or ensuring it, that's not really just a quality issue. It's constant. It's really what you are supposed to be doing as a function of the event, uh, making sure they're not using licensed material, original work, um, and, and maintaining their own of the scope. Uh, how does the chapter that you're working with then, how, how does your event stack up with how other chapters are doing it or the effectiveness of other craft shows generally? Like, how are you able to, or do you see it? How would you benchmark that? Oh, yeah. It, it's, I think the benchmark is, well, for one thing, we do actually put out a survey to the artists to get their feedback on how they felt things went, you know, where they, you know, how well did you, you know, did you have a good day? You know, was it well organized? How was load in, load out? You know, and, and so we collect those comments and every, after every single show we review, what can we do better for our artists? Um, because again, we need them too. Like it's, and we care about them. In fact, what makes our show unique to compared to most shows that are out there is that it is a show for artists that are actually run by artists. I'm actually one of the participating artists in the show most times. So, you know, I have to follow the same rules as everybody else, even though technically I'm in charge. It's a very weird place to be. Um, but because it's run by artists who do other shows, we do have a lot to compare to. And I say that as far as organization and experience goes, we're near the top. Um, also quality, we're, we're definitely near the top. We're not like the highest end you can go, but we're pretty darn, we're up there. We're, we're past your average craft show. Um, and I think that's part of what makes us unique. But a lot of times we get feedback from other, you know, we'll actually ask, how do we compare to other shows that you've done? What other shows have you done? Um, like one thing I can say that makes us a little bit different is that we have volunteers throughout the whole show. There's a lot of shows you'll go. There'll be people there who will help you set up, but they're all gone by the time the show ends. So when you're at your most tired, you have to pack up yourself. Oh yeah. You maintain a lot of support. So I hear it's a lot of support. So in this context of having a, a show that is as good or better than others and, and all that, how much do you relate that to the planning? So, and specifically, how do you plan for that? Because I think that's our topic here tonight. What part is driven by the planning? A big part of it is, is well, for one thing is that you always allow yourself breathing room in your schedule. So that there if something go. goes pear-shaped, because something will always go pear-shaped. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just, you know, that's just how it goes, um, that you can adapt. If you miss an advertising deadline, that doesn't mean that you're done. You just take that, those funds and you shift it into different advertising because you've got a little bit of time to play with it. If say um, an artist gets sick or has a medical emergency, you know, you, you have time to move the booths around a little bit so that it doesn't feel like there's a gaping hole. Um, and even if there is a gaping hole, you put a few chairs in there, you call it a lounge area. You know, you, you do everything, you know, you leave enough wiggle room that if you have to make an adjustment, if you have to go to plan C, D, E, or F, you can do it and it's not the end of the world. Um, you also make sure that you have time to, like I build time into the schedule to go to our storage unit to make sure that everything's there that needs to be there. It's a small thing, it's really not, not even a whole day, it's like maybe a couple of hours. But by doing that, then I know that when I give that task to someone to go to the storage unit and pick stuff up, it's less of an issue. And even if something gets forgotten, mm. we've made it easy for somebody to just go over there and get whatever was missing. Um, you know, that's a big part of it, is just making sure that you build time for chaos. I, mean, you know, I tell people, I plan for chaos. I almost count on it. Um, <laughs> something's going to happen. It's going to be crazy. And that's okay. It's, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, well, you sound like a project manager because that's one of the things I've always argued. I think what we are is we're people that do two things. We try and see the future, right? We're future tellers. This is how it should work. Here's how it could work. And the other one is, is bringing order out of chaos. I mean, it's just this fog of ambiguity in front of us, right? And you never know what's oh, yeah. happening. Well, something you just said there that, that's interesting that I hadn't thought about either is, uh, you were thoroughly planning, checking the, in this case, the specifics is checking the warehouse or checking the storage unit uh, to be ready. So that's a task that needs to be done. But you do it so that when you have tasked someone else, you know that they can be effective in it. 
So a role, uh, something that just came across in some other discussions I've had, and, and, and it sounds really interesting what you said there, is part of your role was to identify where your team will have problems. And you're planning against that as much as planning for the final solution itself and the final outcomes that you need. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if, 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 if you want, and especially because we're a volunteer, because we're volunteer-based, we have a few people yeah. who are paid to help us with the show, um, and, and we try to use our funds as effectively as possible. But, you know, a big part of it is, is that you have to be able to give people things to do and you have to make it as pleasant and as relatively easy as possible for, in order for people to even step up and do it. Um, I'm very much more of a carrot than stick kind of person. You know, I, I want to make things so that it's pleasant that, oh, I volunteer because I enjoy this, this experience. Um, I, I'm willing to help out because it's not a burden. It's something I can do. It makes me feel good doing it. And it's really not hard. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, is, is I, I try to be as, as efficient as possible because at the end of the day, um, I want to be as lazy as possible. I don't have to try so hard. So if I have things that are well planned out, that are well organized, I know where everything is, everything's labeled, everything, you know, it's by the way you just follow the steps one two three four five then i don't have to try so hard and it it's much less stressful <laughs> so. what do you well so let's ask two questions before we uh we bring on somebody who trains in the field uh, or trains others in the field what do you find is the most difficult part to plan now that you've done it a couple times you have something repeatable so i guess it's very easy just punch out the card and you're all done just hand it off and walk well, away no, not quite I wish. so what's the hard part what, what did you find the hardest Okay. Um, I think the hardest part is, you know, you're always going to have uh, your, your, the thing you thought would never happen, happen. You know, uh, <laughs> the obvious example to that is COVID. I mean, that happens and that was like, okay, so what do we do now? You know, um, and the only thing, like I said, the, there, there's not a whole lot you can do about that, except stay calm, not get, take anything personally not get upset the other challenge that i have is i am not a confrontational person i do not love sending out emails saying by the way you know that character thing you were said you were planning on having in your booth please don't have it in your booth like i do not enjoy that i get hives i i really really don't like confrontation but the only thing to do for that is to suck it up and just be as professional, be as calm, take nothing personally, and just do it. And just, you know, if I have to say something, say it. If I have to ask somebody to not do something, I have to do it. Because the plan will fall apart if I don't stick to the rules that we've created. Yeah. Um, I have a recommendation on that one, by the way, uh, if you'd like, you, since you asked for it. Oh, that's right, you didn't, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, <laughs> What, what I have found is, uh, as they say, hire your weakness. You just need to make somebody like the vice president of standards enforcement or something and let somebody who enjoys making sure it's right will do oh, that for a, you because we have a vice president of standards. Yeah, we have a vice president of standards in charge of the jury. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's funny because she, she will be like, Christine, just tell me and I'll tell them they can't come. Okay, thank you. And the answer to that is <laughs> thank you. Yes do that okay listen what we're going to do is we're going to bring on a little bit more it's it's interesting when you're planning an event versus a product which of course you're also planning to deliver your products when you arrive there so i'm imagining one is about moving parts and the other one's about what you can control but of course you have to produce the output so i imagine there's a difference in your planning there uh that oh, yeah. we might want to get into but i want to bring on joe so uh tonight we have uh, as our pm expert uh who who is a uh, going to lay down some truth on us is uh, Joe Lani, president of project management experts, PME. That's how I see it as PME because his logo is everywhere if you're around DC because he is one of the <laughs> major supporters of the Project Management Institute, of chapters, of symposia, symposii, symposium. <laughs> um, and uh, he's a major chapter of PMIWDC, I happen to know. And uh, so thank you for that, sir. And I see it all the time. So He's been around probably as long as I have. I've, I've seen you at everything, man, You're out there trying to train a whole new cohort after a cohort after a cohort of project yeah. management uh, folks. So yeah. first as a chapter leader, let me say thank you for your support and for continuing to promote the discipline that it actually works 
and that there are standards and we should follow them and then we should learn things. And yet, and yet we know that there's some adaptability that's needed. So how are you tonight, yep. sir? I'm great. Great. Thanks for having me. I was yeah, interesting. Listening to you. Oh, there we go. Okay. So first of all, oh, tell yeah. us what PME, oh, yeah. PME is. What is it? What does it do? And what do you do? Go ahead and tell us, tell us the spiel here, man. Well, we, we've been around for almost 15 years now. We're a project management uh, training firm. We do do some consulting, but most of our business is in um, uh, is in training. Everything from traditional project management to agile development, earn value, leadership. Uh, we have over 30 um, project management instructor-led courses and over 300. Uh, e-learning courses um, that we partner with MindEdge, who is also a PMI Washington chapter uh, sponsor, you may know. So uh, we try to cover the bases. We try to um, stay current in all the latest uh, project management uh, happenings and uh, academic un um, uh, information. So we're constantly looking to develop and uh, deliver different types of training. So, I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years. Um, you look you look younger than I am, Kendall. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, I've been doing this since I started with young. We just have to get you in a volunteer management role and then you'll even feel older. That's how that works. That's what Christine and I talked about off camera. Okay, so I recently yeah. saw an ad from one of your uh, courses as I want to do, poking around. And I thought it was a great setup or framing for what we're trying to talk about tonight. Some some PM true talks, right? Some truth on this here. Um, and it was essentially you, you you posed the question that if we're asking agile or predictive planning, mm -hmm. which is best and under what cases? And your 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 answer was that you're if you're asking that question, you're asking the wrong question to begin with. So what's a better question? What was your point in that? You know, there's Christine out there trying to do the best she can as fast as she can. Yeah, I think the and the reason I got I I, I opposed that when I was at a at a PMI conference before COVID, um, somebody came up to me and said, "Hey, Joe, what is what's the best approach to planning a project, agile or predictive?" Just to give you some perspective, what Christine. Um, clearly does is predictive project management, specifically meaning she does a great job of collecting requirements. Um, she surrounds herself with experts, people that uh, understand um, a little bit more than she does. She brings them in. She creates a good, solid project schedule. Um, she even does risk assessment and response planning and response management. She even um, does great commun. I heard her great communication was the key. And those of us that have been doing this for this long know that um, we're in the people business and communications is, is a major factor in getting our job done. And I think she even did a great job of, uh, of describing our typical um, customer, which I think she used the term clinically insane which is what we're all dealing with when it comes to dealing with our customers and meeting our uh, stakeholders requirements. That's predictive, meaning that she is able to collect the requirements, plan exactly what is going to happen, start to finish from day one to the end of the project. So this, this, this person came to me and said, Joe, which is better? And my question, my answer to him was you're asking the wrong question. It's not which is better, which applies best to your project. So if Christine was asking me for my advice and say, Joe, should I use Agile? I would say absolutely not. You know, you know pretty much what you're up against. You know pretty much how the project is going to shake out. So you would want to use a predictive approach. Collect the requirements, deal with the risks, assign responsibilities, um, communicate well. Uh, um, and uh, put together a good project schedule. And this, 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 this schedule and this, this plan will be repeatable. It's going to get easier. Uh, forgive me, Christine, I didn't catch how many times you've done this, but I promise you every time you do it, it's going to get a little bit easier. Now, Agile's different. Agile mm -hmm. says when the computer comes to me and says, Joe, 
I, I don't really know what I want, but I'll know it when I see it, right? That's a candidate for an agile project. In other words, the customer is saying that I want to evolve the scope with you. I want to, I'm going to give you a little, little bit of knowledge and can we work together to create the project's product and let's deliver it in increments. So rather than deliver the whole, um, the whole big kahuna, right? Let's deliver, let's deliver the product and, and even release the product in increments. Uh, through a series of multiple sprints. So a sprint is typically a three to four or two to four week um, uh, batch of work where five or six um, team members will go elbow to elbow for mm -hmm. multiple weeks to create the product in increments. So you might do in a typical sprint, you know, um, you might do, I don't know, it all depends on the size of the product. But say, for example, you did 10 sprints and at the end of every sprint, sprint, you're releasing a piece of the product. So, so we find that Agile works really well in, um, in, in software IT environments where we're developing products where, um, and we're working with the customer to understand what should go in those product, what should go in those uh, software modules. Um, Predictive works really well, for example, in construction, in, um, in where you're, you're laying out an architectural plan, you have a design, and you're building against that plan. So it, predictive works really well. Christine would fall into that predictive environment and that predictive approach, if you will. So um, it's the two approaches, no one is better than the other. It's just a matter of when do you apply it. I'm thinking I can't wait to have her back on here. Oh, there she is, Christine. Come on back in here a second. Because I have a question. I, this is based on observing my daughter, who's in the beginning of the art process, uh, coming out of college, who is very frustrated that the artist by, it may seem unfair, but it's her experience, as a matter of fact. The artists seem to be, by nature, self-selected for people who don't think in standards, processes, repeatability. It's all about creativity and variation. And so... <laughs> The whole idea that something is due kind of goes over their head. Um, I think maybe being motivated by selling something is interesting. Now, not to cast everybody in that light, but something that speaks to ad the agile approach, the less uh, predictive and more adaptive approach. Do you find or have you found that the production of art is different than putting on this event in that sense? We talked about how to compare them earlier, but I'm wondering if you're seeing differences in what Joe said, this idea that we as a group or I have to produce something for a client and we don't know what that looks like yet. I mean, is that real? Is that a thing? Would that be an example of a different style of project planning you in, you undertake? Yes. Yes. And, and your daughter's not entirely wrong. I hate to say it. I mean, <laughs> it feels like it's a bit of a betrayal, but yeah, artists tend not to be real great at systems until you start talking about their media. Then uh -huh. they're all about they don't know. Tell us more. Don't tell them that. They'll they'll be like, no, no, that's not true. But you know, ask any ceramics person. They'll they'll tell you about all the different phases, and then they have to do this, and then they have to glaze it, and then they have to fire it, and like, and there is an absolute system there. They just don't like to admit it, or they're not aware of Man. it. Um, but yeah, you're right. There are a lot of artists who are pretty squirrely when it comes to their planning philosophies, uh, at least from what I've observed. I'm weird in that. I think with both sides of my brain. I am both an entrepreneur, businesswoman, and I'm an artist, and I acknowledge both parts of those lives, although they're more close than most people like to realize. When you're developing a product, like for example, I've got a show coming up in a week, um, so I'm in the process of making sure that I have enough stock to put in my tent for that show. Um, it is more of a, uh, I guess, production line where I'm gonna get X amount of this done by X date, X amount of this done by that date. And I don't necessarily have as many hard and fast deadlines and I can make more compromises. I don't know if this is actually falling into agile or not, but it's one of those things where I do plan. I say, I, I need to have at a minimum this amount, uh, ideally that amount, and I'd be so happy if I can have that amount. And so I plan my time around getting enough stuff actually made and then process where I take photographs. 
I, you know, update my inventory. I do all the business side of art so that by the time I set up my booth for the show, I've got everything I need to have as successful show as possible. And my planning ability will often funnel directly into the odds of me having a really good show. Now, that's different than planning a show because, uh, yep. you know, it, it's yep. hard deadlines. I cannot compromise with the venue. Like, I can't negotiate. Once that contract signed, it's signed. There's nothing I can do to change when we're allowed to, to, to cruise in and cruise out, you know. And so it, yeah. it, it is a different process. And it's a different mindset. But at the end of the day, the skills are really similar where it's that you got to know where everything is. You know, you have to build in time for things to happen, the unexpected, you know, and you have to be willing to, if you suddenly have to change something or adapt somehow that, that, you know, you have to be willing to let that happen and just go along for the ride sometimes. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things, Kendall, I've learned is that, for example, research and development, um, researchers tend to, um, tend to do well or better in a agile environment. They, they struggle a little bit in a predictive environment where they're held to a fixed scope. Um, in an agile environment, they're not held to a fixed scope. So agile works really well where the researcher can evolve, can be creative um, as a team member, uh, can evolve, create, change, modify, elaborate the product um, along the way. And they're not, they're not cubbyholed into a fixed set of requirements. Uh, that's why we find that in, our, in an R&D environment, uh, Agile tends to work well. First of all, it fits the, it, it fits the goal of creating a product uh, better. So medical, for example, medical research, um, um, drug research, things like that tends to be better, work better in an Agile environment. Um, but bottom line is the project manager still has to has to maintain some level of a schedule, even if it's for a three or four week sprint. So there's always some matter of structure, okay? And it goes down to, can you define the product beforehand or not? If you can, then you can plan much like the way um, Christine is doing. If you can't define the product well, uh, during planning, then Agile is probably a better approach to you. And there's a, few, a number of different flavors to Agile too. So, um, and I think yeah. and I think what's interesting yeah. is that you mentioned that whole it's it's for people who need to create, you know, mm -hmm. and that's it's true for artists too. Like a lot of artists love boundaries. Boundaries are great. They just don't want to be the ones to set them and organize them and plan them. <laughs> they want to be the person yeah. inside the boundary doing their thing. Um, you know, one thing that yeah. is, is common, is the most terrifying thing to an artist is a blank canvas. You know, when you don't have any boundaries, it's hard to pull yourself together and get the thing done. But if you have that boundary and you have that person who is managing, you know, overseeing the schedule and say, okay, you've got We've got a week. This has to be, you know, we have to give a status update in X amount of time. Then it's like, oh, there's my boundary. And now I can play within that. And I'm sure I can get that done. You know, and that's, I think, you know, in part when you're managing an artist or you're managing somebody who's in a creative type field, I think that is the key is that it's like you give them the boundaries and then you give them the freedom within the boundary um, yeah. to really help that creative process along. So we're talking here with something this this went to a different place for me. I think is really interesting to me is it's about the nature of the stakeholder themselves, where they're coming from, R and D, their own role in this. So so I had some other questions, but let me let me ask this and then with you, Christine, is how much does your being an artist inform how you can run an event itself around this? And the reason I ask is this may not be as complicated as some of the more complex weapons systems, medical devices and things like that, that we, we, we know that many project managers in the federal beltway who might be listening to this uh, experience. But having said that, how expert in the field do you need to be to be able to do something like organize the sale of things, organize the event and the show that you're in to be part of the member organization you're in? What is the role of your own expertise? Not, not in putting on an event. I mean, in terms of being an artist. I think the, the 
place where the expertise comes in the, the best for me is when it comes to communications and empathy. So when okay. I have an artist who contacts me who's panicked because their blue balls didn't show up on time and now they don't have no idea what they're going to do with their display and how am I going to, then it's like, okay, I, I feel you. I know exactly where you're coming from. And I can give you like five different sources that you can go to right now that can solve the problem. So from a communications problem solving point of view, it comes in very handy. But could somebody do what I do and not be an artist? Absolutely. Because this is the, this is the time where I take the art side of my brain and I shift it over to the side because right now the business side has to take over. And, and gotcha. so, you know, so if I were to say, if somebody were to be in charge of something like this and you're not an expert, you're not a content area expert, have an ally who is, who can do that side, who can take care of that side of things so that when somebody comes to you with a question, and you don't know the answer, you've got someone you can rely on who can answer it with empathy and understanding and and really help, and also with expert, expertise. Um, but otherwise, you know, this is, it's an event. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be the bride to plan a wedding. You don't have to be an artist to plan an art and fine craft show, but it helps yeah. for those times yeah. when you need to communicate. Yeah, I think expert judgment is is key. Any project manager needs to know how important it is to be surrounded by people um, that have expertise, especially in the technical areas. As a matter of fact, I teach I teach a lot of PMP prep, a lot. I just finished a class yesterday um, with a client, and I tell my students if you answer a if you get a question on the test and you're totally clueless of the answer, I mean clueless. An expert judgment is one of the answers. Choose it because your odds are better that you're going to get it right. Because we put and PMI puts a lot of emphasis around around surrounding ourselves with people that are more technical, especially in the content area, especially in the functional areas. Um, in, in Christine's case, folks that understand the creative process or understand the the jewelry making process. Um, although it sounds like you have a lot of those skills, which I think makes you uniquely qualified to do this and you're able to go between, you know, being a PM and being a, um, a creative person, but not every project manager has that. I mean, we often are, we have our own skills, we have our own uh, expertise in project management. And, um, and when I was managing projects, I was the least technical person on the team. And I wasn't afraid of that. I just I wanted to get people's input and needed to, needed to surround myself with the right people. Well, I, I, I made the price of the ticket back tonight uh, with your last comment, Christine, that the role I think with the stakeholders, not so much thinking of the artists as team members, but rather as people that I'm having to, and since cater to, right? They're the people that are showing up that, that are the event. This idea that the more expert, expert I am in the field I'm being a project manager in, the more I know how to communicate with them, that's expert knowledge, but empathy, that's a big deal. I understand even as the consultant or the, the ringleader, as you said, or the senior artist or whatever that role of authority or positional authority or expertise that you have, this idea that I understand what they are facing and, and yet we need to do the plan, right? So. Right. I think um, I think I, I just got I got my money's worth tonight on that one. I'm going to bring in Beth. Beth said she was fielding. I just heard that Beth is fielding some questions or has one coming in off of YouTube. Beth, you out there? You got a question for us? Uh, there she is. Yeah, I do. In fact, um, Orlando G asked for a perspective on the phrase "plans are useless, but planning is indispensable." And I would offer uh, my view on that. Um, remember that quote is from. Um, Eisenhower. So we're talking a time without the internet. Um, and so if you have a plan, you might be using a printing press to distribute it. And you're not changing it uh, every hour, every day, or every week, or even probably every month, or maybe never. Uh, so I think when he said plans are useless, he's talking about a static document. And I think that um, the message we take from that is that plans need to be a living document that you can continuously reassess and update to adapt to emerging circumstances. So I, I don't think we should take it to heart that plans are useless. I think we should realize that 
Um, if a static plan that you develop and put on a shelf is useless, uh, a plan that's a living document is not uh, because it's, it helps you remember that indispensable planning process you went through. Yeah, a plan is a document that should be made available for change. <laughs> is readily available to change. <laughs> right. It's how you change is the issue. It's Christine, how you I, 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 think one of, I, think one, I think one of the advantages Christine said, maybe at the end of the process, now that we've done the work and the plan has been updated for what happened, that's probably what you're able to hand off, I would imagine, right? So it's not so much you keep oh, changing cool. it at that point, but that it's valuable to others, I would assume. The plan... I mean, I, I can honestly say this is that, you know, with every show, the plan changes and updates. It's never exactly the same because, you know, circumstances change. Uh, you know, we come up with a better idea. We, we find that, you know what, this works better than that. And, and rather than say, oh, but that's not in the original plan, you know, if, if that doesn't help anyone. If, if, if you have to be willing to evolve. You have to be willing to change. And sometimes that means that, that that thing that you had planned and envisioned for hours gets tossed out the window, and it gets tossed out the window. You know, <laughs> I, I put down a plan for our loading dock, and our assistant coordinator came up with a better one and on the fly. And, you know, I was like, hey, that's a really good point. Go for it. You know, because if, as long as the ultimate goal where everybody stays healthy, safe everybody gets in and out safely and efficiently that's that's the goal so if my plan doesn't come up with a goal but somebody comes up with a better idea go with it there is no point why you know it's like what i say isn't golden you know i'm i'm not perfect i don't know everything and i have to be willing to learn and i have to be willing to listen and that's how things run smoothly not because i'm the you know grand pooba of the show or anything that's not it at all so I've got a question. I've got two questions for you as we get closer to the end of our hour here. And uh, you said something chilling, I would imagine, to Joe. I'm going to guess for him here. One of you in your opening comments, you said, "So there I was. You know, um, I didn't have any training, and here we have the man who's been training for 40 years." <laughs> what? What? I don't know what she means it. <laughs> I expected him to tell us all the things you did wrong because clearly you need training. So here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> question. Uh, I, I'm going to ask two different. I'm going to ask it slightly different for the two of you. Uh, so ponder. You're going to get to ponder for five seconds. Here we go. So Christine, what do you wish you had known about project planning that you didn't? That you have since discovered. What do you wish you could have been trained to? What do you wish you could have known? Hold the thought, Joe. Why do we need yeah. training? She figured it out. She got it all there. What is it that training would help make more robust for us in this kind of context? And maybe because things have changed over the years in planning. So with that, Christine, what do you think you were missing? What do you wish you'd known that, that you know now? Um, I think really in some ways it was systems. I, uh, you know, I, I did not start with Excel. I literally started with a giant calendar on a piece of paper that I penciled in every single date and I counted backwards and, you know, and then I was, and then when I, at the end of the show, I was like, all right, I got to do this again. And I don't have a clue how to set that up. Like I did not have systems in place. So I really, I think I would have, if I had understood what the tools were, if I had understood the theories, I think I would have panicked a whole lot less because that first show that I planned was super stressful because I had no idea what I was doing. I was just guessing and doing what I thought made sense, which fortunately it worked out. Uh, it was a good show. It was, you know, we were very happy. And now it's much easier because I have that experience behind me, but I still have gaps in my, my information. I, I still am learning how to, uh, you know, organize things better. I'm still refining those processes. I, uh, you know, so yeah, I think I will never say that education is a bad thing. That, you know, being the sort of person who can learn as I go is a great gift that I've been blessed with. And that, because me, either that or I'm just too stupid to just be like, I can't do that. I'm like, yeah, sure, let's try it, see what happens. Um, but I think having a, an understanding of systems, having an understanding of the tools to keep things organized, um, I think that would have 
that would have served me very well. And I think that's something that I would have been really nice. I am a little bit impressed, though, a little in the sense that you said, I'm never against education, but in a way you kind of are, because you said, if I had known what this really looked like, I might have panicked if I had like the theory, <laughs> right? We could train people out of the excitement and the fun of causing change and things to happen, right? You go from a non-event to there's an event from craft people who haven't sold things to crafts people who sell things um, and, and have income from it. And you're, you're affecting your community that way, clearly, right? So um, it's interesting, this idea. So Joe, you might want to play with that a little bit. What are we exposing people to that make, you know, if you see how big the ocean is, it might be terrifying. Yeah, I think that, you know, you, I think you were, you were asking me about what type of training would I have recommended yeah. for someone yeah. like Christine. And first of all, you know, you would have learned, you would have learned the formal method to the madness. You figured out the method on your own terms. You figured <laughs> out what you need to do because my sense is you're, you're an organized person to start with. So you knew the questions to ask. In a formal, you know, terrain, like say a two or three day fundamentals course, um, we would we would give you that documented process, that step, especially from a planning perspective, that step-by-step -step process. Here's what you do first. Here's what you do second. Here's what you do. There are multiple things you can do third. We would give you that process. Along with that, um, you would get some tools. You would get some templates. Um, you would get, matter of fact, we even teach a, um, a three-day fundamentals course where we incorporate Microsoft Project, um, which is a project scheduling tool. We incorporate that into the class, and we ask students mm -hmm. like you to bring a project to class. And in the, as part of the class, we plan it. We plan everything you just said. We, you know, we do the scope statement. We do the project schedule. We do the work breakdown structure. We do the risk assessment. So you would have learned all of those things and actually walked away uh, with a functional plan that you can continue working and growing on. So it kind of adds value. It adds working value to the training. So we don't build decks in our training. We build, we take actual projects that people are working on and we ask them to bring it to class. So it kind of brings it to life. So if you were asking for me, my recommendation, um, that's what you would benefit from. I think, um, and you, I think you have a good start. I mean, you have the knowledge already. Go ahead. Thank Sorry. you. I think you're going to end up being at the, uh, at the state level as the chief planner for all the guilds, shedding light of project <laughs> management right. on all right. the different chapters of the guild here between yeah. the two of you. I think you're up to that. So, um, I, I, I appreciate what you guys said there. Uh, so I think that's going to do it for us for tonight. Uh, I want to, uh, as you hang out here for a second, I want to thank the audience and invite the audience for joining me and thanking the two of you to take the time to to prep for this and to show up and talk to us a little bit. Uh, hey, audience, uh, tell your friends about the free PDU. We know that's part of the gig, right? Because it is a membership organization. <laughs> if you're not making money, you better be making PDUs. And feel free to shoot Harry, uh, Harry Zolkauer, he's your president or, or uh, president-elect, I guess, uh, a note on the topics that you would like to hear about because we're always sourcing them. As you heard, this is four of eight. We have a live one coming up in September with the symposium, uh, but there will be other ones that we're gonna webcast here. So make sure you let him know what you're interested in uh, and what you've seen and heard and, and her, uh, with what you have seen and want to deal with. As you've heard here on our webcast here on PM True Talks, we can go from the complicated to the direct, from Deming's management theory down to uh, you know event planning at craft shows. How do we deliver the actual value with the people standing around us, right? The people that we work with. So thank you, Christine and Joe, for taking the time to do that. And in leaving us tonight, uh, Christine, where can the audience get hold of you? Like where, where are your shows happening? Where's your jewelry at? Where can they find out how it really works with someone who didn't get the training, but they still can bring home the plan? How can they get hold of you? <laughs> Well, uh, um, you, you can always uh, see our upcoming shows uh, at HaverfordGuild.org. Uh, you can also go to PAcrafts.org to, uh, or yeah, PA Crafts <laughs> for um, uh, the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen. The next show that I'm doing personally is going to be Ludwig's Corner up here in Pennsylvania, in beautiful Chester County, uh, next weekend, the 25th. And um, the next show that Haverford is doing is actually going to be November 12th and 13th 
at the community, uh, the Haverford Community uh, Recreation and Environmental Center. Um, so come on out. I can certainly give all that information over to you guys. We're actually, our applications are closing in just a couple of days. So if you also happen to be an artist and you're interested in doing a really awesome craft show, we're still taking applications. Um, but yeah, so so come on out. I will make sure uh, that you guys get my um, get websites and information. And um, you can always uh, contact me through the contact form on the Haverford Guild website, or you can go to rightbrain.net, and there we, go. Uh, we have a contact form there. And so if you're interested in some awesome graphic design and illustration, we, we do that too. <laughs> Christine Wright with because Right Brain. Why not have several businesses? <laughs> We've got to keep it moving, right? That's the business side. Right Brain Design, thank you. Joe, how do they get hold of you? Um, you can go to our website at um, projectmanagementexperts, one word, dot com, uh, and see our courses. If you want to contact me directly, I'm at jdlauni at projectmanagementexperts.com. And we do offer, um, all of our training is discounted to PMI Washington chapter members. Uh, there are 10% discount on all of our courses to chapter members, and maybe we can talk to the Southern Maryland chapter and then uh, as a, in a partnership agreement, we'd love to do that. So um, that's how you can reach me. Thanks. So we need we need a partnership agreement. We need some topics, uh, listeners, and also there's no chapter <laughs> that can't do anything without volunteers. I know Southern Maryland and PMIWDC both like to get volunteers. I'm sure the Haverford Guild does as well. Uh, right. Everything is related to how volunteers do do work and support us. So thank you, Dan, and thank you, Beth. And with Beth, I'll hand that back over to you because I think we have a slide on PDUs here. But thank you and good night. Beth? Thanks, Kendall. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Joe. I enjoyed the show. The slide was shown before, but I think Dan can put it up again. Um, a reminder that you get one PDU. And you need, we would love for you to take the survey. We need your feedback. And uh, this show is, was, is recorded, was being recorded, and will be posted to PMI Southern Maryland's YouTube channel. So you can access it online and view it again and share it with your friends. Thank you. And good night.